So Francis is our first speaker and he's going to tell us about the moduli space of tropical curves and Feynman integrals. Francis, go ahead, please. Thank you very much for the introduction. <clears throat> yeah, so I'm going to talk about um, moduli space of tropical curves um, and its relation to Feynman integrals. Um, so the general theme of the talk is um, to interpret amplitudes um, as, and in, and in this case, Feynman integrals, as volumes of cells on some natural geometric object. Um, so this is a, a, a long running theme um, familiar to, to, to all of you. Um, of course, in, in string theory, we look at integrals over moduli spaces. Um, string amplitudes are certain integrals over configurations of points on, on curves. And of course, there's, there's the, the amplitude hedron and the program for interpreting amplitudes as, as um, integrals of certain um, differential forms um, on cells in, in, in that. Um, so this, this, the general theme won't come as a surprise. Um, this talk, uh, I've given variants of this talk before, but I've decided to emphasize things in a very different way today. Um, if you'd like some more information, there's an archive um, preprint here, 2101. I've written a number here with all the details in it. I also gave a recent talk at the Harvard Mathematical Picture Seminar in which I emphasized um, very complementary aspects of this story. Um, you might want to, to, to have a look at that. There's some excellent questions that the participants asked at the end. It's worth watching it just to, to hear those comments. Okay, so let me begin. Um, today, we're going to look at the MG TROP, which is the moduli space of tropical curves. Of course, it's relevant to, to string theory. Some of you know this very well. And the cells on this space, uh, C, G, W, uh, are, correspond to weighted graphs. So a weighted graph is a graph in which um, the vertices carry weights. All my graphs will be connected and finite, of course. And what I want to do in this talk is to define on this moduli space of tropical curves um, certain differential forms. And they will be absolutely canonical. So um, there'll be um, uh, an algebra, omega can, of, of canonical differential forms. And they will be forms on the moduli space of tropical curves, but they will have poles somewhere. And in fact, they'll have poles whenever the, the, the weighting on the graph is non-trivial. We'll get to that. So once we've got our tropical moduli space, we've got some differential forms. We can then integrate these differential forms over cells and hope that we get something interesting. Now, um, what we actually do is we don't integrate over the cells, but what's called the link of the cells. So it's the cell quotient that the cells can be scaled by a parameter. That's just, just a small detail. But in any case, to any cell we, and, and such a form, we can associate a number. And the surprise is that this number is always finite. And what this does is um, this theory gives a way to connect uh, Feynman integrals, because it turns out that these integrals are exactly in the same shape of Feynman integrals, and as I'll explain, they seem to give the same numbers as um, Feynman integrals we know and love. But on the other hand, they're very geometric, so they give a bridge between Feynman integrals and um, classical questions in, um, in geometry. So the core module of graph complexes, moduli space of curves, of abelian varieties, and general linear groups. So um, in, in, in this general uh, area of amplitudes, it's very often that uh, mathematics is, is used to, to answer questions in physics, and that in turn gives rise to a lot of very interesting mathematical questions, which drives new research. But there aren't so many cases that I know of where a, a question in pure physics leads to a result in pure mathematics. And, and here, this is a, it's an instance where it does. So um, one reason for giving this talk is to appeal to your collective expertise in this matter, which is vast, um, because here we will see Feynman integrals, where if you can prove that they're non-zero, then you prove a completely new theorem in pure mathematics that's of genuine interest to geometers. And so that's, that's one of the, the messages I'd like to take home. Okay, so let's get started. Tropical curves, um, 
the, the reference that I find most useful is uh, Branetti, Mello, and Viviani, an excellent paper where they define these concepts. So a weighted graph G comma W is a graph in which every vertex has an, an integer weight, okay? Um, it is stable if every vertex of degree zero has at least three edges coming out of it. That's essentially the only condition. There's a trivial condition saying you're not allowed a completely isolated vertex of weight one. We can, we can ignore that. Um, a metric graph then is a graph in which you ascribe um, a length to every edge. So every length, every edge gets a length, um, which is a positive real number. There are no external legs in this business. I mean, there can be, um, but today I won't be considering external legs, okay? So a tropical curve then is a stable weighted metric graph and its genus is given by this formula here. It's just the loop number of the graph plus the sum of all the weights. So here's an example of the sort of graph we're gonna look at. Um, it, it has one, two, three loops um, and its genus is therefore four because you need to add one for this, this vertex has weight one, okay? It's stable because this vertex of weight zero here has three um, edges emanating from it. So that's okay. And um, uh, the metric property of this graph is that we're gonna give a length L1, L2 and L3, L4 to every edge on this graph, okay? So now um, to look at the moduli space, we now can vary these, these edge lengths. So the space of possible lengths is the cell C G comma W and it is the set of all possible lengths and there's no constraint on the length, so it's just the positive real numbers to the four in this case. And it doesn't depend, it doesn't involve the, the weights of the vertices in any way. Okay, so what happens now if we, um, if we uh, contract edges? So if we let the length of an edge, LE, go to zero, you can think of that as the same thing as contracting that particular edge down to zero. Now, the rule is that if you contract an edge that meets vertices of two different weight, of, of two weights W1, sorry, two different vertices of weights W1 and W2, then when you contract, you add the weights together and the new vertex gets the sum of the original weights. When you contract a tadpole like this, then the vertex goes, gets a weighting which goes up by one. So this vertex here is weight W plus one. And of course, it's a very important point that it, often in quantum field theory, we don't allow ourselves to contract tadpoles. Uh, that's going to play an important role later on. So let's look at genus two. Um, let's just focus on the left-hand side of this picture here. Um, here are all the, the weighted, the tropical curves of, of weight, um, sorry, of, of genus two. Let's start with the sunrise diagram here. Um, we can contract any of these three edges to get a pair of tadpoles. Then when we contract, say, one of these tadpole edges, what happens is the vertex gains uh, a weight, becomes weight one. And finally, when we contract the final tadpole, we just get a single vertex of weight two. And you can amuse yourself and do the rest with the right-hand side. Now, as is very well known, this combinatorics of contracting weighted, um, weighted stable graphs is encodes the boundary strata in the deline mumford compactification of the moduli space of curves of genus two. So here the, the single vertex two corresponds to the generic uh, Riemann surface of genus two. And what you do is, is look at simple closed cycles on this surface and you pinch them. And each way of pinching it leads to degeneration until you end up up here with, um, say, two Riemann spheres joined at three points. And the dictionary between these pictures is that a vertex of weight W corresponds to an irreducible component of genus W, and an edge corresponds to a node. So here, here you've got two genus one curves joined at a node. It corresponds to this graph here. Good, so I've indicated in green, so this will be a general theme, all the graphs where you have a weight 
um, bigger than or equal to zero. Like here you have weight one, weight one, weight one. And in fact, what is going to play an important role for us is this part where all the graphs have weights zero, okay, the blue stuff. Right, so how do you form the tropical moduli, moduli space tropical curves? Well, we have all these cells, one for each uh, weighted graph, and it's the set of all possible lengths of the edges. And on that, um, the group of automorphisms of the graph um, acts because the automorphisms of the graph permutes the edges and the vertices. It needs to permute the vertices in such a way that it preserves the, edge, the, the vertex weightings, okay? But in any case, it, it, it permutes the edges. And so every symmetry of the graph acts on this uh, space of uh, edge lengths. And you can define the, the C bar GW to be the quotient space of R to the EG. Sorry, that should have a positive, a, a, a positive but greater than zero sign, which I omitted. I apologize for that. Uh, modulo the automorphisms of the graph. And that inherits the quotient topology. And then to form the, the uh, moduli space of tropical curves, you then glue together all these possible cells, modulo automorphisms, along um, all the common specializations of different graphs. Okay, so if two graphs um, via contracting edges lead to a, a common uh, specialization, then you glue along that face. And in that way, you glue all these cells together and you get a certain space. And that space is quite tricky because you've got these, these quotient singularities, okay? So here we had, um, going back to this um, picture here, we had the sunrise and this dumbbell, and they both specialized to a pair of tadpoles. So let's just focus on that part. Um, the cell associated to a sunrise is, it has three possible edges, so three possible lengths. It's R cubed, modulo, its symmetries and its symmetry group is the symmetric group on three letters. So it's R3 modulo S3, it's unordered triples of positive real numbers. The dumbbell, same, it's R3 again, but the symmetry group is only of order two because you can just switch the two ends of the dumbbell. And then we take these two cells, they're three dimensional cells, and we glue them along the locus corresponding to the, the, the common contraction, which is this double tadpole graph. And its cell is an R2, it has two edges, modulo its symmetry group, which is S2. So we're gluing two copies of um, real three space along a, a two space. But it's tricky because you've got all these automorphisms. So it's a bit easier, instead of looking at the cells, to, uh, to look at the links. So the links I'll write with LC. And the link means um, essentially that you impose the condition that the sum of all the lengths in your graph is one. Um, and that, that's going to make life a little bit easier. And that drops all the dimensions of the cells by one. And so instead of using looking at cells, let's look at the links of cells. And now the, the, the link of a cell is just the set of all possible edge lengths such that they add to one. And that's now a simplex. And that simplex, it will be easier to visualize. So let's look at um, this sunrise diagram, the set of all edge lengths. Um, is a triangle in R3, right? This triangle here. Then what happens is as one of the lengths goes to zero, we move towards one of these boundary components. So there are three of them for each possible edge contraction. And we get a tadpole here. Now it has, its cell consists of um, uh, two lengths, which add up to one, so that's just a line. Okay, and so in this way, you can draw these pictures where going to the boundary of each simplex corresponds to contracting edges. So here we get in, in, the, in the, the link of this is this three cell, sorry, this, this two cell, this triangle. The dumbbell gives another triangle. And what we're going to do then is we glue, we take this triangle and we're gonna glue it along its three edges. So these three edges all correspond to the same graph. So they're all glued together, if you imagine, sort of a napkin and, and, and identifying all three edges, you get some sort of, some sort of pouch, right? Some sort of, a bit like a, an old fashioned purse. So here I've attempted to draw this, this pouch, it's indexed by the sunrise diagram. And it's got one edge corresponding to this, this blue edge here, which is here. And the dumbbell as well gives another pouch. 
And uh, this one edge here is, is a tadpole. So it gets glued to the edge of the other pouch. And then, but there's this other extra edge here, which is in green, which I've tried to draw. So maybe this picture is probably not very helpful. You really have to sort of think about it yourself to get your head around this. And here and, and later, I've indicated in green the stuff that corresponds to graphs with a weight of at least one. You can see it's a smaller dimension. Um, good. OK, so um, differential forms. Um, what do we want? So how are we going to define um, a differential form on this space? Um, and, and the key point here is, well, one key point is, first of all, you, you want to define a, a form on sort of each, on each region of it. And they need, to, they need to glue together. They need to be consistent on the overlaps. But the more subtle point is that, um, that we've quotiented by automorphisms. So these forms have to be um, well-defined. Um, and to, to see that, for example, this, this edge here has, um, has a symmetry of order two, which, is, which, is, which flips both ends, because this graph here has an automorphism which flips both sides. So in, in the moduli space, this edge here gets folded upon itself and it has a, a, um, a double point in the middle. So that, that's, the, that's, the, that's the issue. So to define differential forms, we actually want collections of differential forms for um, every graph or, or for as many graphs as we can. We're going to consider a smooth differential form of degree K on the corresponding cell, okay? And um, another way to say that is just, it's just a form on real space, real R to the power EG, such that it's invariant under permutations, so it passes to the quotient, and such that these forms glue together, they're all compatible. So what we're gonna do then in, in this sunrise example, we wanna consider a form of degree K um, on, on, on the interior of this, this simplex, depending on, on three parameters, L1, L2, L3, which sum to one. We also want a differential form on the dumbbell simplex. And when the edges go to zero, they should both give the same differential form, which is the one corresponding to, to this edge here, which, which is associated to a tadpole, uh, the two tadpoles stuck together. Okay, so a differential form is really a collection of differential forms on every cell, on every stratum, such that they're all consistent. Um, now that's quite a tricky thing to do um, explicitly. It's, it's very hard. I, I don't only know of the construction I'm going to um, explain today. Um, and the construction I'm going to give will actually give forms with poles, right? And they're going to have poles along all the green stuff. So they'll have singularities along every stratum corresponding to a graph with a, vertex, a non trivial vertex weight. Okay, so in this talk, what we could do, we could simply have thrown away all those graphs. Um, and that's equivalent to saying that when we contract tadpoles, we, we, we sort of throw them away. The contraction of a tadpole is zero. Um, so if, if, we, if we take that line of approach, we're, we're really talking about the outer space and a certain different, a different type of geometry. I, I thought I would emphasize the um, moduli space of tropical curves for this talk because it's, it's more closely connected to string theory. In any case, so we're gonna construct um, differential forms now. So how do we do it? Um, so to, pr to uh, prepare um, the definition, um, I want to talk about bi-invariant forms, which is something quite classical. So if we take um, a matrix, an invertible K by K matrix with entries X, I, J. So think of these as just generic entries. They're, they're variables, if you like. Um, the matrix D, X is the matrix in which you, the entries are D, X, I, J. These are differential one forms. So think of the entries as, as being functions, parameters that are moving around. Now, the analog of D log Z um, our favorite differential is mu of x is x inverse dx. And it is left invariant. So that means if you multiply a, a x on the left by um, uh, an invertible integer matrix, then a very easy calculation 
um, tells you that mu of a times x is mu of x. Okay, and I, I've done it here. You, it, it takes about 30 seconds to work out. However, it is not right invariant. So, so this logarithmic differential form is, is not quite bi-invariant. The way to get around that is the following trick. What you do is you, you take mu x to the nth power. So mu x is a matrix whose entries are differential one forms. Okay, so when you multiply, it's the usual rule for multiply, multiplying matrices. But the entries, when you multiply entries together, they have this um, uh, graded commutative law. Okay, so then you multiply these matrices, the matrix of itself, n times, and you take its trace, and that gives you an n form. Now these things are are, are differential n forms. They're they're quite extraordinary. Um, they always vanish when the degree is even. If the matrix is symmetric, they vanish in a further half of the odd cases. Um, they're always closed forms, and they're always bi-invariant. So what we get out of this, if we're looking at symmetric matrices, which we shall, we get a, a, a set of forms, um, beta 5, beta 9, beta 14. And these are very, uh, play a very important role in, in arithmetic. They correspond in some sense to odd zeta values, about which more later. So we have some a, a, a machine for generating differential forms out of matrices with nice properties. So here's an example. Um, let's take a generic two by two matrix. So um, you can compute B to B3, B, B3X. Um, it gives, gives this thing here in the denominator, you've got the determinant squared and then um, some very nice differential three form in the numerator. If we take a generic symmetric three by three matrix, then beta three vanishes, because I said for symmetric matrices, half of these forms are zero. And, and the interesting, the only interesting one is beta five, which gives the, in the denominator, the square of the determinant times um, some very nice five form, okay? In this case, they're very explicit to compute. In general, they get very complicated. So how do we construct canonical forms? Well, the recipe is very simple. We're going to start with a graph and it's not going to depend on, we're not going to um, depend on any weights or anything like that, right? We just take a graph. A graph for me is connected and has no external legs. We associate to the graph, it's graph Laplacian, graph Laplacian matrix. Now that depends on a choice, um, a choice of basis of, 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 of cycles in the graph. And then, um, from that matrix, we, we do this in this bi-invariant form, right? And that gives us a differential form. And it turns out that that doesn't depend on any choices precisely because of bi-invariance. And then it has um, lots of wonderful properties. It's um, equivalent with respect to all automorphisms. So if you, if you permute the edges of the graph according to an automorphism, this graph, this form doesn't budge. And also these forms are all compatible. They glue together with respect to contractions, which is exactly what we want. So the upshot is that we can take these forms and we glue them together to get a differential um, of degree five, nine, 13, et cetera, on the link of the, 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 the part of the tropical moduli space, of, the moduli space of tropical curves where the weights, the edge weights, where the vertex weights are zero, okay? will have poles along, along the, lo the locus where the vertices have weights, um, non-trivial weights. We don't care about that. So once you've got these differential forms, we can, of course, take wedge products of them and get more forms. So omega can is defined to be the exterior algebra on these canonical forms. Here's an example. We take the wheel with three spokes. Um, I've numbered the edges one to six. Now the Laplace matrix, I'm sure everybody knows this very well, but let me recap quickly. Um, this, is, this graph has three loops. So the Laplacian matrix is a three by three matrix. And to write it down, we choose um, a basis. We choose these independent cycles here that I've written in with little red, red circles. So the first one is, is one, three, five. So in the top entry, we put alpha one plus alpha three plus alpha five all the edges that occur on it. The second cycle is one, two, six. So in, in, the, in, the, in the diagonal, second diagonal entry, 
we write alpha one plus alpha two plus alpha six. And the third cycle is two, three, four. So we write alpha two, alpha two plus alpha three plus alpha four. Then in, in the off diagonal entries, we look at um, the, the edges that are common to two cycles. So, so this entry here um, is minus alpha one because alpha one occurs both in the cycle one through five and in the cycle one through six. Likewise here, we have minus alpha three because it's, it's sort of the intersection of one, three, five and two, three, four. Okay, so it's very, very easy to write down this matrix. Then we take, um, we take its inverse lambda g inverse d lambda g we multiply with itself five times we take the trace and we get this differential form and here the denominator is the determinant of the graph laplacian which as we all know is the kirchhoff or first semantic polynomial um, so now canonical integrals so given any such um, canonical form so it could be a wedge product of of these gadgets could be omega five wedge omega nine, for example. Now, if I pick a graph um, with the right number of edges, so because I want to the cell, the cell of which we're going to integrate needs to be of the right dimension. So it has to have the number of edges is the degree of the form plus one. And in that case, we can simply integrate this canonical form over the link of the cell of the corresponding graph in which all the and we think of that graph as, as being the, the, the cell in the, in the tropical moduli space where all the weights are labeled zero, the, the, all the vertices are, have a given weight zero, okay? And it's just a projective integral of this differential form over the region where the Schwinger parameters alpha e are positive, okay? So it looks very much like a Feynman integral. So the theorem is that the first surprise is that this integral is always finite, which is exactly the contrary of, of most quantum field theories where we have divergences. So this is very surprising. You take even the most divergent graph possible, its canonical integral is always finite. Next, the, the integrand has a very nice shape. It's, it's um, omega g, some standard differential um, that we're very familiar with. The graph polynomial in the denominator, like all integrals um, in, in, uh, in quantum field theories involve, uh, can involve this graph polynomial times some numerator. So it looks very like um, residues in, in say massless 5-4 theory um, in, written in parametric form. Um, now here's, here's something um, extraordinary is that there are massive cancellations that happen here because when we take this, to, when we take this trace, let me go back, we have the inverse of the Laplacian, which that, that's gonna give us one over the determinant, but we expect to see it to the power of 4K plus one. When we, when we raise it to the power four k plus one, but in fact, it only appears to the power k plus one. And that means that catastrophic cancellations between the numerators and the denominators, um, which are due to some sort of Dodgson type identities. And it's very reminiscent of what happens in quantum electrodynamics in parametric form, um, which was studied uh, in detail by, by Marcel Golds in his thesis. Um, there are very close similarities with this story. Um, what's nice about these canonical integrals, there are lots of ways to relate different graphs. There's a Stokes formula that relates the canonical integrals for very different graphs. And so we can prove relations between them topologically, and I'll come to that in a minute. Um, I'm a little bit behind, so I'll skip the idea of the proof. I was going to say that we, um, since this is very familiar to many of you, um, we, we, we do a usual, we, we um, interpret the integrand as an integral in projective space with poles along some locus xg, which is the graph hypersurface. That's where the denominator, that's the zero locus of the denominator of the integrand. And, and what we do, and, and the domain of integration is, is the real coordinate simplex, it's this triangle, which we interpret as um, being a copy of the cell um, of all possible edge lengths, or rather the link of the cell in the moduli space of tropical curves. Then we do some blow ups um, and we get some new faces. Uh, and the miracle is that when, when you pass this blow up, the canonical forms are always finite on the exceptional divisors. And that's just not the case for Feynman integrals. When, when you do the blow up with a, with a Feynman integral, you find you get a lot of poles along the exceptional divisors. And the whole theory of renormalization is, is precisely to, 
to find counter terms to cancel out those poles. Um, but we don't have that problem here. Um, so when you do this, this blowing up business, you, what you find um, is that after blowing up, your original simplex um, becomes a more complicated polytope. Um, some of its facets are, are old ones. They cross, like in this picture we had, we, we had a triangle and by, by blowing up, we introduced three new edges to form a hexagon. So some of the, half of these edges are, are old ones. They correspond pre-blow up and they correspond to cells where you contract an edge, right? Because going to the edge of a simplex was, was sending an edge length to zero, if you recall, and that's contracting an edge. But they're new facets and you can prove that the new facets um, correspond to products of links of cells um, corresponding to graphs, subgraphs and quotient graphs. Now, um, what we can do is apply Stokes formula to this polytope. And um, if we integrate the differential of, a, of D of a canonical form, so that's a zero. If you integrate zero over a, a domain, you get zero. But by Stokes formula, that's the same thing as looking at the canonical integrals along every facet in this polytope. And so what we get is the sum of the canonical integrals of all edge contractions of G, plus a bunch of terms here, which exactly corresponds to the Conkrimer co-product, um, about which I don't want to say much more, um, but um, um, it, it's now, um, I think, well uh, understood that this geometry of blow-ups um, reflects a lot of the um, structures that we use a lot in quantum field theory in a purely geometric way. So maybe that's not a surprise. Okay, examples. Um, so uh, let's look at canonical integrals. So there are very few which are known. Um, the reason for this uh, isn't anything uh, sinister. It's just that the, the archive preprints from January 21, um, that's six months ago. Um, you know, Feynman integrals have been around since the, the, the 50s, maybe the 40s. Um, so it'll take a while to catch up. But we have um, some examples computed by myself, but also um, Oliver Schnetz and Misha Berinsky have computed some more. Um, and I invite you to, um, uh, to, to try to compute some more because we will learn an awful lot. Okay, so let's take the wheel with three spokes. As I've explained, the canonical form omega five is 10 times omega g over psi g squared. Many of you will immediately uh, recognize this as the Feynman integral for the Feynman residue um, in dim reg. So that's 60, you get 60 times as each of three. Now the rule with five spokes, we get something more interesting. Omega nine is some thing that the first term is omega g of psi g squared with which we're very familiar. So the integral of, of just this piece happens to converge and it gives a um, zeta seven. I believe, a zeta seven. But there's an extra term which has got the product of all the, the, the edge parameters of the internal legs, the, the, so the internal spokes, divided by the graph polynomial cubed. And if you integrate this, you get a zeta seven and a zeta five. And this linear combination exactly conspires to cancel out the zeta seven and just produce a, a zeta five. So it's an example of, of, uh, of massive weight drop. So that's zeta five. Now, uh, with the wheel with seven spokes, it's the same thing. Um, it's just a bit more complicated. Here in the numerators, you've got the product of all the internal spokes, and you have higher and higher powers of the graph polynomial in the denominator. And here, a, a priori, you'd expect a zeta 11, zeta nine, and zeta seven, but everything cancels out, and you just get the zeta seven. So I conjectured that the wheel integrals, that the canonical wheel integrals, are always single zeta values. And Oliver Schnetz um, guessed the, um, well, found a prediction for the rational coefficient based on some uh, further numerical calculations. Now, if you could prove this conjecture, that would be great. Um, in fact, if you could prove that this integral is non-zero, that would imply some new results in geometry. You'd, it would say something about the cohomology of some spaces that is not known in pure mathematics. So here's an, an example of a, a Feynman integral calculation that can lead to a, 
a new theorem in pure mathematics that has nothing whatsoever to do with physics. More examples. So um, the zigzag uh, with five loops, here it is. So there's a relation that twice the zigzag integral um, for the canonical form omega nine is the wheel with five spokes. And that's an example of a, a Stokes relation. And I'll explain in a minute how to do that. So um, the, the, the two vertex join of a wheel with three spokes with itself. Normally we think of this as z to three times z to three, or the six z to three squared. In this setting, it's zero. Here's a tricky one. Take the graph, the complete graph with six, with six vertices. So you take six vertices and, and connect them in every, every way. So you cannot get more divergent than that. Um, here's the integrand. Um, it's, it's amazing that it converges. And Berinsky and Schnetz have calculated it and found a zeta 3,5, an amazing calculation. Now let me compare with Feynman residues. So if we look at Feynman integrals um, in DIMRAG, um, we can take the residue, pull in one of, if they have a, an overall logarithmic divergence, so the number of loops is twice the number of edges, then you can look at the pole um, in one of epsilon, it has a simple pole in one of epsilon and look at its residue. And that's a number which in many cases is given by this integral. Um, in general, it diverges, but it's finite whenever the graph has no subdivergences. okay? Let's compare and contrast the Feynman integrals on the left-hand column with canonical integrals. Um, so um, here we have the wheels. Uh, this goes back a very long time. The wheel integrals were calculated many years ago and give odd zeta values. Same with the canonical integrals, except that the weights are completely shifted. Um, so the, the zeta five in the canonical world comes from a wheel with five spokes. In the usual Feynman story, it comes from a wheel with four spokes and so on and so forth. So the zeta values are occurring with wheels with much larger numbers of spokes. Um, in the canonical world, we have a zeta three times zeta five. Same, we can do that by, by, by joining graphs, as you know, in quantum field theory. And here's something totally amazing. Um, the the K34 graph, first calculated by Broadhurst and Kreimer many years ago, discovering the first instance of a multiple zeta value in quantum field theory. They got a zeta three five, and they found this very particular combination, zeta three five minus 29 over 12 zeta of eight. And recently, uh, Berinsky and Schnetz did the canonical integral for the complete graph, K6. They find the exact same zeta 3, 5 occurs in the exact same combination. And the explanation for this is that um, it's very plausible that all the canonical integrals are actually Feynman integrals um, up to integration by parts identities. So the question is, is it the case that the canonical integrals are all in fact Feynman integrals by integrating by parts. So I have a, a, a proof mechanism that proves, so if the wheel with three spokes, they're the same on the nose, there's nothing to say. For the, the, next, the first interesting case is to compare Feynman integral for wheel four with the canonical integral for wheel five. And I have a, 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 a proof, sketched proof here, which makes it absolutely convincing, but I'll skip that. Um, finally, a taste of graph homology. So graph homology is lurking in the background. Um, it was defined by Konsevich uh, many years ago. So here you take graphs which are, have an orientation. Orientation means um, uh, uh, informally, it's just a wedge product of, of the edges. So what it means is it's a, it's a sign plus or minus one. And um, to determine the sign, you, you, you choose an ordering on your edges. And if you flip to um, two edges round in your ordering, you change the orientation by a sign according to the usual rule of, of, um, of differential algebra, okay? Um, and then there are obvious relations that if you, if you switch the orientation of a graph, that's the same thing as the negative of the graph and um, automorphisms act on graphs and act compatibly on their orientations, okay? So then Konsevich says, well, let's define a differential on the linear, on the vector space spanned by oriented graphs. And the differential is you just contract every single edge with a certain sign. Now, if you do that operation twice, you get zero. So you get a differential, d squared equals zero. And you can define the graph homology to be the kernel of this map d, all the things that are killed by d, modulo boundaries, the image of d. 
Okay, so this looks kind of trivial, but it's actually very, very subtle. It, this graph homology is a huge thing. It's very mysterious. It's related to the groton dieck teichmann Lie algebra. Um, it's related to the cohomology of the moduli space of curves and very little is understood about it. Um, examples, I'm running slightly late. Let's um, just run down to the final example. So if we take this graph here, um, uh, and we, we take its differential, we need to contract every edge in this graph. Now, most of those edge contractions just give zero for, for sign reasons. Um, and but you can check that if you contract the middle edge, you get a wheel with five spokes and you contract this top red or this bottom red edge, you get two zigzags. And this identity in graph homology exactly explains the relation between the canonical integrals I wrote down earlier. Okay, so graph homology dictates um, some of these relations. Conclusion. Um, so what we've done is we've looked at the moduli space of tropical curves, and upon it, um, we defined some completely natural differential forms um, on that space. So explain to do that, you need a form on each cell, and they've got to glue together in a nice way. Um, and th those have poles. The construction I've given gives poles. Um, but that's not a problem because if you integrate it over any of the, 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 um, the interesting cells, you get a volume integral, which is always finite. Then um, those integrals, the form, the shape of the integral, the integrand looks exactly like a Feynman integral. And furthermore, when you actually compute the integral, you get the same numbers that seem to come from Feynman integrals, which we already know. Finally, um, I tried to explain that if you can prove that canonical integrals are non-zero, because they're connected to graph homology and relations in, in the graph complex, you can deduce new theorems in pure mathematics and geometry. So on the left-hand side, we have Feynman integrals, um, which are very well understood um, in, in the physics community. Um, on the right-hand side, we have questions that are beloved of pure mathematicians that have apparently nothing to do with, with them, um, or moduli spaces of curves, general linear group, abelian varieties. And these canonical in integrals form a bridge between these uh, two subjects and pass information back and forth between them. So on that note, I'll stop. I apologize, I'm ever so slightly over time because I forgot about questions. So I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, st I'll stop here. No problem. Uh, let's thank uh, Francis for that very beautiful talk. And um, I can invite some questions. We have a little bit of time. Oh, hello. Uh, um, uh, I'll take David. I can see his hand. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Francis. I'm interested in the number theory content. We know that in Phi to the fourth theory, at seven loops, we see polylogarithms of six roots of unity. And at eight loops, you saw something associated with a K3 surface. Yes. You expect such numbers to appear on the mathematician side? That's a good question. I, I don't know. I don't know. There are, um, there's no evidence either way, just yet. Um, let, 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 let me ask an even bigger uh, question. Do you, do you expect the number theory content uh, to be smaller on the mathematics side than it is on the physics side? So, so there, there are two scenarios. One scenario is that there, there's some magical reasons why these integrals always give MZVs. Um, maybe there's there's some other way to write them that makes that clear. On the other hand, um, the fact that you can write them as periods of um, Feynman integrals, you know, linear combinations of Feynman integrals of the numerator, would strongly suggest that we get all those numbers you mentioned appearing as well. Uh, except you're also saying cancellations. You, I mean, the, that exactly. big zero. So, so either, either could be there's sort of two two possible. Uh, there's a fork in the road. Um, and, um, and it's not clear which one nature takes. Thank you. Okay, um, are there any other questions? Yeah, yes, Stefan, do you want to go ahead? Yeah, oh, yeah. hi Francis, nice hi. talk. Uh, just a small clarification. The degree of the forms which come from the symmetric matrices is 4K yes. plus one. Yes. So the first sequence should be for five, nine, 13. 
Yes. I uh, was a little bit confused. I thought I saw a 14 somewhere. Um, because 5 plus 9 is 14. Ah, okay. Yeah. I thought I was missing something. Thanks. You can take, oh, you can take uh, omega 5 wedge omega 9. Okay. Yeah. That clarifies it. So, uh, um, yes. Uh, Andre, do you want to ask a question? Hello. Um, yeah, it, it, uh, hi Francis, thanks for the nice talk. Um, I was just curious if, well, I don't know if we have time, but if we have time, could you uh, maybe highlight some of the, uh, of this proof between uh, the, the, um, the, the, uh, the canonical integral? And, oh, if you're interested, and... um, it's so uh, very quickly, what you want to do, so let, let's, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but we want to integrate omega yes. nine over the, the, the wheel far, the, the, the polytope corresponding to wheel with five spokes, okay? And this, this canonical form is complicated, um, but we know it's, it's a cohomology class on projective space um, where you've deleted the, the graph hypersurface, because that's what singularities are. And, and this cohomology was calculated by Bloch, Inor, and Kreimer, um, and it's just got one, it's of dimension one, and it's the wrong weight. Um, mm. So, so, th so th it can't be that one. It has to be zero. So this class omega nine is zero in cohomology. We know that by pure thought. So it has to be exact. It has to be d of something. So therefore, we then apply Stokes' theorem and re replace the integral over the the, the wheel phi, the, the domain corresponding to the wheel with five spokes, and and replace it with the integral of of an eight differential eight form over the boundary. Now the boundary, as I explained briefly, corresponds to graphs where you contract or delete edges. And you look at the boundary, and again, alpha eight, for, again, for weight reasons, has to be trivial, has to be exact. So now you integrate over the boundary of the boundary. And now in the boundary of the boundary, the only interesting thing, thing you find is a wheel with four spokes. Because at the bottom here, if you take a wheel with five spokes, you can delete an edge, you can delete a spoke, for example, and then contract another edge to get a wheel with four spokes. So the, the cell, um, corresponding to the wheel with four spokes sits inside the boundary of the cell corresponding to the wheel with five spokes. And two applications of Stokes' theorem means that you're going to pick up um, an integral corresponding to the wheel with four spokes. And again, by, by the same result I mentioned, we know what the cohomology is for wheels. There's only one class and it's spanned by the Feynman integral. So the only thing this integral could possibly be is the integral, the Feynman integral of a wheel with four spokes. Okay, I see. That's a proof. So that could be done uh, explicitly on a computer. I haven't done it. I haven't gotten around to it. Um, but it's a it's a pure th it's a thought experiment that right. tells you it has oh. to be the case. Yeah, yeah, that, that's convincing. I, I guess I guess it's it, yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe these. So the, the reason is, is that particularly the simple because the cohomology groups are just one dimensional. Though. Yeah, exactly. And, so. and the, the fundamental reason is is topologically the wheel with four spokes is a sub quotient of the wheel with five spokes. So if you're very astute, you might say, aha, but it, 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 I had this, this, this uh, compare and contrast slide. The K34 is not a, 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 a sub quotient of um, the complete graph on six vertices because it has seven vertices. So, so it doesn't work in that case. But the, the K34 is a weight drop graph that the, the, the integrand drops in weight. So it actually sits on a smaller graph. So I believe that K34 and K6 have a common refinement upon, um, upon which sort of the true, <laughs> the true uh, zeta 35 sits. And in, in physics, it appears as the K34, and in the canonical world, it appears at a K6, amongst other things, perhaps. Thank you. Great. Okay, so I think um, we do have uh, maybe ten minutes for discussion. So I think we'll okay. we'll wrap up for the talk here and thank Francis again.